Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third podcast of Ops Intelligence. I have a special guest with us today, uh, uh, Dr. Mark McClure. Uh, he's the uh, CEO uh, and founder of Resfrac. Uh, with that being said, I'd just like to welcome uh, Mark on board and get started. All right. Thanks for having me, Haas. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for coming. Okay. So um, we have a list of questions today. We're going to go like, like go through. I thought Mark has a lot of, has extensive experience in frac and, and hydraulic fracturing. He has a good vision. Uh, he's a Stanford guy. So did I, did I say that right? You're a Stanford guy, right? Yep. Yeah, Stanford graduate. So, so the first question that I have is, what is your overall vision for data science and, and automation uh, in the energy sector in general, it's like especially the oil and gas industry? Yeah, well, so first, maybe I should introduce my, my company a little bit. Um, sure. So uh, I founded Restrack about five years ago. We make a combined hydraulic fracture reservoir simulator. So I'm actually an interesting interview for this podcast because we make a physics-based solution. We are not a predominantly machine learning or AI company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so actually, I should probably start by kind of giving my view of how those things work together. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we do in ResFrac is we try to understand physically um, why hydraulic fractures propagate, how they propagate, and then how you produce through the reservoir. And then, of course, that allows you to build a physical model and then predict, um, well, if I, does, if I change this frac design, um, how would that impact the production, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're doing it from kind of this causal kind of physics-based perspective. You know, the opposite perspective, which is not in opposition exactly, but it's different, which is machine learning or artificial intelligence, or uh, to use a more old fashioned word, statistics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and that's where you look back at what you've done in the past and you try to identify patterns and then use that to, to kind of make decisions. So I think that those two approaches are in fact very complementary, And I think that's probably like the number one message I would give to this podcast, right? So there's pros and cons to both approaches. The, the advantage to a, a data-driven approach is that you can apply it even if you don't have a strong understanding of the underlying processes, right? So hydraulic fracturing in shale, for example, is complicated and it's hard to know what's happening because it's deep in the earth. And so there's a lot of challenges to, to doing engineering of hydraulic fracturing in shale and oil and gas in general. Mm -hmm. And so if you could just look back and say, well, you know, I've got a database with a thousand wells in it, I can just analyze the frac designs of those wells and see which frac designs led to the best production, that's obviously a good idea, right? And so that's very powerful to be able to look back at the past and learn from the past, learn from experience and predict the future. So that's, that's really the, the value of a machine learning approach. But there are limitations to that approach. The limitation is that it can't predict out of sample behavior. So um, if you look back at those thousand wells, I would imagine that whatever thousand well data set you have is probably not somebody that went out and used experimental design to run a very nicely structured sampling of every possible combination of every frac design uh, in a way that maximizes the information content of those experiments. In fact, what happens is they probably ran the same frac design on hundreds of those wells, <laughs> right? Yep. And then they maybe yep. changed like four things at the same time and ran that next frac design. So the problem is you're gonna have really uh, co co uh, kind of correlated inputs Mm -hmm. uh, as well as because they're correlated, the, it might seem like you have thousands of wells, but the actual sample size is much, much smaller and you're still solving a, a multi-dimensional space. So you're going to have a hard time innovating and, and designing new ideas um, when, when you're only learning from experience and you're not thinking in the future. And I think the best example would be the financial crisis in, in 2008, 2009. Uh, people were valuing uh, options and, and financial derivatives and different instruments based on how those financial options had behaved in the past five to 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Where of course, if they had been looking at the underlying causal thing happening, which is like, what's the actual mortgage market doing? Uh, they would have realized how crazy things were. And that's in fact, what people did do. So it's, it's, it's good to look at both. You know, it's, it's good to learn from experience and, and identify patterns of data, but you also uh, do want to have an understanding of what's happening and, and these things work together. So yeah. if you have an understanding of what's happening, that helps you, iterate in the field faster. Um, and, and so you're learning from experience, but you're also improving at the same time. Um, so that's, that's how I think these two things work together. And I think that's what needs to happen. So I think that, you know, the reason that this data science and data driven models have gotten so much attention in the past decade is because, uh, you know, there have been some great technical improvements in the field, like, um, 
know, deep neural networks have dramatically improved the ability of computers to do things like uh, image recognition and, and voice recognition and, and things like that. They're really extraordinary advances. Um, and, and so people are finding all sorts of amazing applications of that. But at the end of the day, it, it's still a pattern recognition technology. And even if you had perfect pattern recognition, you know, there's a limitation to what you can do there. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's not a one or the other thing. I think that um, we, we should be using those things together. And, and that applies to, to virtually, you know, every aspect of engineering. You know, I work specifically in reservoir engineering, but, um, you know, it applies in other areas as well. I'd also mentioned there's kind of a trade-off between, you know, how much data do you have and how much understanding do you have, mm -hmm. right? So for example, um, if you're in a situation where like you're just dealing with a, a piece of equipment um, on the surface and you have many, many of these pieces of equipment, uh, then you have actually really good information. And I'm, my dog is trying to get on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to the podcast. We're all, we're all all home these days, so that's, that's, that's pretty common. <laughs> like, why is he not paying attention to me? Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm in. Get out of here, buddy. All right. All right. So, <laughs> the, um, all right. Sorry, go away. All right. Sorry. <laughs> um, to complete my thought, the, um, the, uh, you were talking about when we have like, you know, uh, data availability. Yeah. yeah like so, so if you have a lot of data and mm -hmm. you have good knowledge, like it's a piece of equipment and you can mm -hmm. gather a lot of information about the runtime of many of these pieces of equipment over a long time, then maybe that's all you need is a data driven approach. But like when you go into something like reservoir engineering, you go, oh, we have thousands of wells, but you know, but you don't have really good data on those thousands of wells. You can't see the fractures. It's very non-unique interpretations. Uh, so you, uh, reservoir engineering is, is rarely, in most cases, not a, uh, a data heavy project. Uh, here's an example, you know, uh, of, of when you maybe do have a lot of big data is, uh, you know, like um, if you were optimizing a steam flood in a, in, a, in a ground field and you have many, many wells and they've been changing rate and production and injection rates many, many times over many years, uh, maybe that's like actually a, a pretty data rich, big data problem that you could use machine learning on. But like where I'm at, where we're trying to optimize frack designs, we just don't have that level of data. Even though it seems like we have thousands of wells, there's so many correlations between the inputs. There's so many confounding variables and, and heterogeneities and other issues, hidden variables, things that we don't know, um, that it's actually very problematic and not impossible, but it's challenging and there are issues associated with trying to purely do a data-driven approach. So that, that's how I think we should be thinking about this, is how do we build uh, workflows that take advantage of learning from the past, which is what data science does, while at the same time also taking advantage of the fact that we do have a physical understanding of the universe, right? I mean, we put a man on the moon because we solved the equations that predicted what would happen when we launched a rocket ship. We didn't launch a thousand rocket ships and then run a data-driven model to uh, see which ones worked and which ones didn't, right? right? So, I mean, obviously there's there's a trade-off there and, and, and it works together. But of course, you know, the, the navigation of that rocket ship, uh, I believe used, uh, you know, kind of like a, um, uh, like something like a common filter that, that was actually, um, you know, updating the trajectory of the rocket. So they predicted the equations in advance, they designed most of it, but then they actually used basically data-driven approaches to fine tune the path of the, of the you know, of a rocket as it goes through space. So um, that, that's a great example of how things work together. Um, and, and I think that's where we should be trying to think about how to, um, you know, push the field forward is how do we design these kinds of workflows where we take advantages of all the tools at our disposal? Yeah, and I also like to like uh, to add on uh, what you said in some areas where we have no data, you know, if you, if you go to a new like exploration area where we have no, like we have, we have no data, the only option that you have is pretty much doing the hydraulic fracture like simulation to come up with some, you know, line, you know, because yeah. so you have, you, have, you have no other option. So so yeah, that, that's, that's a fair answer. So you're saying basically these are complementary like, like approaches we should use, we should find, you know, historical trends in the data, but in addition, we should also look at, you know, some of the exploration designs where we've never tested before and machine learning can give the answer to those answers and, 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 and basically, you know, use those, um, uh, use, use hydraulic fracturing software to, to uh, test those, to actually uh, model those designs, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, here's another example. Um, let's say that you have, uh, you want to optimize cluster spacing in a plug and perf design. Mm -hmm. And your company has done different cluster spacing designs and you found that uh, you needed cluster spacing X and that was the best producer. 
Mm -hmm. But the problem is if you tighten cluster spacing and you don't also use limited entry completion to force fluid into all the perf clusters, then you'll have poor perf efficiency. Mm -hmm. And so uh, tightening cluster spacing is ineffective, right? Mm -hmm. So you could do a data-driven workflow and conclude that you need to not use tight cluster spacing, but mm -hmm. because you're not also bringing in your physical understanding, you're missing the fact that if you had designed the, the, the trial differently, then the yeah. tighter cluster spacing might've done better. Right. Yeah. And so if, if you're just, you know, if you're flying blind and then just looking back and seeing what happened, it's easy to miss opportunities. Yeah. And also, I think you mentioned this. I think that there, are, there are some parameters that are heavily collinear, you know, yeah. so like, for example, stage spacing and cluster spacing. You know, when, when you go to a, a lower stage spacing, not all the time, not all the time, but usually you also go to a, to a low, lower cluster spacing. So if you include both collinear parameters, it could have some some impact on the model as well. You know, yeah. so you, kind of have to, you know, uh, balance it out and, and, and go by those rules. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's so, right. So, so um, I, I know that you're, you're, you're primary, like you have a lot of experience in different areas, but so from your understanding, uh, what are some of the areas that you think machine learning would have, um, would lead to the most automation, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, like repetitive tasks that they'll, they'll yeah, sure. day in and day out. Yeah, well, I agree. I think if you want to just go with a, a pure machine learning driven approach, um, you need to have a situation where you have a lot of data and you can quickly run experiments and, and develop out a training model. Um, you know, and I think like drilling is a great example. Um, I remember when I was in college, I, I did a summer internship on drilling and I went out and I asked every uh, driller, you know, who, what weight on bit and what RPM, what rotations per minute do you use when you're when you're drilling? Yeah. Um, and I assume that there's like a right way to do it. They were all drilling the exact same well. Yeah. Uh, just, they were just pumping out wells, all identical wells in this field. Mm -hmm. um, but the every driller gave me a different answer, yeah. <laughs> like remarkably different, like, uh, yeah. you know, anywhere from 60 to 120 RPM mm -hmm. was how these guys were drilling. And I said, well, you know, does it depend on like, you know, what happens when you when you drill through the anhydrite? Like surely maybe you change something and most of them didn't and some did. And um, the lesson that I took away was there's got to be a correct weight on bit and RPM to use. Yeah. And the way that it's done now is some guy, or at least the way it was being done at that point in time at that field was some guy out there just doing what he thinks is right, which is good because in a sense, that's a data-driven approach. A person out of control who's been doing this for years is drawing on a lot of experience and that is really valuable. Yeah. But I also noticed something that when I talk to eight people and I get maybe four different answers from eight people, yeah. and they're contradictory, then I know that it's logically impossible that everyone's right. right. <laughs> and that was very quickly, right? <laughs> it made it obvious to me that these guys are experienced, but at the same time, if you have a lot of really experienced people who believe totally different things, then, then experience can't be the only thing that matters here. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and even then, it occurred to me that, that, well, you know, like what you should be doing is well, what if we did some controlled experiments and we actually, you know, intentionally varied RPM and weight on bit over time through different formations went back and analyzed the data and we could identify what's the optimal, right? right. That feels like a, a great example for a machine learning algorithm, um, maybe in conjunction with like a little bit of experimental design to make sure that you're actually running tests to train out that machine learning algorithm. I feel like, you know, you could go out there and you could train it an algorithm to, to control weight on bit and RPM and, and probably, you know, just pick up some free money off the street and drill those wells faster. That, that's a, a, an example of where I just think it's a really clear cut opportunity. And, and I, I believe that is actually happening in the industry now. And, you know, that's just an example from um, you know, about 15 years ago, but I, I do think people are doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's fair. Cause uh, I, I think uh, like in this case, the combination of, um, you know, a type of a supervised machine learning approach and also an optimization algorithm, you know, you can let's yeah. just train a machine learning like model, a supervised model, to, uh, you know, to find patterns between all the input features, you know, weight on bit, torque and differential pressure and so on and so forth right. with, with the rate of penetration, which is what you're trying to maximize, right? And then once you build a model, then you can find, uh, you can use an optimization algorithm such as, I don't know, genetic algorithm, particle swarm, you know, uh, e e even Bayesian, like Bayesian optimization, you know, to find which set of features would maximize your ROP, you know? Okay. And you can do this real time, you know, so I think the industry is kind of moving towards that route right now, you know, which is, yeah. which is fairly, you know, I think important. So one area is drilling. Do you have any other areas that you can think of that would 
you know, lead to more automation, you know, within, within the oil and gas industry? Well, I mean, again, I think anything where it's a, like a piece of surface equipment um, where we can see what we're doing and we can control it directly. Uh, so, you know, equipment reliability and, and any sort of control of, of, of the plant, you know, of, 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 of I mean, a refinery is obviously a phenomenal example, right? And anything where you have that kind of information um, an ability to measure it and know, see what's happening is, is a phenomenal and easy application for an automation and machine learning. Uh, but I, I think that the, where, where it becomes challenging is where you like get into reservoir engineering, mm -hmm. where you don't have great information. Um, you have contradictory, imperfect information. Uh, you know, every experiment that you run costs millions of dollars to go out and drill and crack a well. And so that's where you reach the limits of what you can do with a data-driven model. So I just think it's important for us to kind of think, think about that in, in both ways, right? So, I mean, if I was drilling a well, I could run an experiment. I could say, hey, let's just increase the RPM uh, for the next five minutes. Yeah. That costs very little money to do that, right? right. <laughs> almost free. That's an almost free experiment. So I could, you know, I could just sit there and spend, you know, a few days varying RPM weight on bit. We've sampled every single possible combination and now of course, it depends on formation. So that would be an issue that would have to be dealt with. But, you know, you can readily and cheaply run experiments and gather great data versus, uh, you know, field scale operations that cost millions of dollars. So that, that's where we have to kind of strike the balance. But, but yeah, I mean, I think anything involving uh, surface operations. I am. Um, you know, like with hydraulic fracturing, you know, predicting screen out, you know, um, not that we really screen out that much in, in modern track jobs, but but theoretically, you know, could you train a frac, uh, you know, you know, machine learning algorithm to, to like analyze the, the pressure rate data and predict that a screen out is imminent, and then prevent, you know, shut in the job before that. Yeah, you know, that's something where we have data, we can control it. We have a lot of that kind of data. We might be able to train a machine learning algorithm. But but then to take that forward to, you know, oh, we're going to real time optimize the frac job. Well, the challenge there is, is you know, to 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 optimize the frac job, you're optimizing net present value of production over many years. And so that's a complex optimization. You know, if you try to minimize stress shadowing, the, the, the fractures might be too far apart, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so because there's so many considerations that go into that, uh, it's, it's, it's not quite as easy to, to, to the input output is not quite as, as quick and, and responsive as, oh, well, the well screened out, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that's where um, you, you gotta kind of make sure you're, you're not overselling the machine learning. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's take a little pivot to another side that I was going to ask you. So uh, as you know, deep learning, you, I think you mentioned it at, at, at the very beginning, uh, deep learning has really uh, started to take off, you know, within different like industries, you know, algorithms such as recurrent like neural network or, or convolutional neural network. Convolutional, you know, is usually used for uh, image and voice recognition and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, do you think that voice recognition specifically will become more common in the oil and gas industry? You know, in, ter in, in, in terms of, let's just say, you know, I can, I can tell, hey, um, pull up this well and, and let's do a DCA analysis. Let's do this analysis and, and that, that analysis. And, and things would become much more automated at that point. You know, do you think that that's a route that the industry is going and, and it is going to happen or no? Well, I mean, I think that's an extraordinary idea. Um, I think the total addressable market of that solution is far huger than even the oil and gas industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, as somebody who sits and runs computer models all day, um, you're constantly in a situation where you could express in um, 30 seconds what you want to do, and it could take hours to do it on the computer, right? Mm -hmm. You could say, I want to take, uh, I want to run... 10 simulations of uh, varying cluster spacing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I want to uh, calculate net present value according to the spreadsheet. And then I want to make a, a line plot of net present value versus cluster spacing. Okay. Yeah. I just said that. Um, what we do in ResRack, for example, is I'm constantly trying to add in new user interface features in order to make that streamline process. Things like you can save uh, what you want a plot to look like in advance. And then we have like a wizard that will automatically generate the same exact plot for 10 simulations or will take the results from 10 simulations and plot them up together in a single line plot. So we're constantly trying to um, create kind of 
we have to bespoke, you know, we have to, we have to handcraft in a user interface, every single possible workflow the user wants to follow. Um, whereas it certainly has occurred to me many times. Yeah. A, if I could use words to tell the computer what I want, and then it can, you know, run those simulations and make those plots for me. Um, you know, that's not the fun part of my job. That's not the fun part of being an engineer is not, you know, getting data together and making a plot of it. Right. And, and so there's a lot of companies. I mean, there's, there's another company in, in my, uh, my the venture fund that I'm a part of, uh, um, you know, seek, for example, yep. they are a company that helps streamline these sorts of workflows. But yeah, it'd be pretty nice if you could just tell the computer what you want and it could put together at least basic workloads like that. But if you could solve that problem, that's not an oil and gas problem. That's like a trillion dollar idea that would transform the global economy. So it's a big challenge also. And, and I think we shouldn't understate the difficulty of that challenge. Um, and if it was, you know, there's a lot of really smart people in many, many industries all over the globe trying to solve that. Yeah. Uh, and when they do, um, you know, I'll buy stock in that company. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I think I think uh, in general, that's the route that anybody wants to go. But I think there's going to be yeah. a lot of challenges. You know, I'm not saying yeah. this happen, but I think as as you uh, like alluded to, it's going it's going to be a little bit challenging, and it's not going to be as, as yeah. Big. And I think the technical challenges. I'm not convinced yet that the current generation of artificial intelligence algorithms is up to the task, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that if we think about the history of artificial intelligence, you know, the earliest ideas were basically rule based, like I could just basically write a script like if computer, you know, if human asks for this, do that, right? Um, that's kind of what I'm doing now in my user interface. I'm trying to imagine what a user might want to do, and then I'm just programming in those workflows, right? But that's that's inefficient because there's an unlimited variety of things that human might want to do, sure. and so you're never going to make that scalable. Then what we do now is is this pattern recognition stuff. It's totally data driven, right? Yeah, we can we can uh, you know put a million images and a hundred thousand of them are dogs, and we can train the machine learning algorithm to identify which are pictures of dogs. Great, yeah. But there's no causality or kind of like fundamental understanding in that algorithm. It's just a pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also a little bit concerned that it's going to be difficult to convince or, or to, to to be able to program a computer to to do unstructured things, mm -hmm. um, because when I'm in the process of, of oh I want to make a plot. Um, how are you going to train a machine learning algorithm to do that? I mean, I guess we could have humans, you know, make a thousand plots and then we could train the machine learning algorithm on that. But we go back to the same problem of the actual like number of combinations and iterations of things that you're probably going to want to do is so huge that it becomes combinatorial and, and you're never going to be able to train, you know, uh, like, like this is, this is why AI can't imitate humans because humans the, the variety of things that a human might do and can interact is far huger than any hope that we could ever have of building a training algorithm. So it can only solve like very, very concrete, specific problems. Yeah, we can identify dogs. Okay, fine. Then we can identify cats, right? We can identify all kinds of animals. That's still an extremely structured and, and linear path, whereas like dealing with reality and dealing with humans involves very um, nonlinear, and, and, and just a huge variety, the combinatorial, you know, orders of magnitude more complexity. And, and I believe long-term you're gonna have to bring in, again, causality. <laughs> you're gonna have to bring in some kind of representation of like reality and logic um, in conjunction with these kind of pattern recognition tools. So I, I, I'm not actually optimistic about like that kind of thing yet um, because I just think things are too diverse. I, I think we're gonna have to, where AI shines is like really focused niche applications. We can we could optimize RPM and wait on bit to maximize rate of penetration. Yeah, that is a very concrete problem. But write a program that I can just tell it to do a thing on my computer. Um, you know, they've been trying to do that for a long time, and they it hasn't happened yet. Got I it. think that's why it's it's, it's too open. It's a, it's an open ended problem instead of a very discrete defined problem, and that's where even the modern AIs are are not effective at this time. Got it. Got it. So you talked about, you know, your software like RESFRAC and what you guys are capable of doing within that like software. So are you guys looking into implementing some type of, you know, either machine learning or some type of pattern recognition within your platform? Like, you know, yeah, right okay. absolutely. Actually. So um, we are uh, rolling out in the maybe Q1 of next year. Um, finally, it's kind of overdue actually, but automated history matching and optimization. So our company to date has really been, a Ford simulator. So yeah. you can tell it, hey, this is how I'm going to do the frack job. 
or this is what the geology is and it'll predict. Um, of course, we are data driven. I mean, we're not totally independent of reality either. So we have to do a history matching step where we have to modify the model inputs to be consistent with, with reality. Um, and that's probably the most time consuming part of using our software right now. And so of course, you know, more mature software solutions already have built in, our, um, you know, automated history matching. CMG has a nice automated history matching, for example. Yeah. Um, so obviously we need to do that. Uh, and then similarly optimization. I mean, I can say, okay, well, I'm gonna test a bunch of cluster spacings and see which one's best, but if there's really 10 design variables, right? Uh, what I really need to do is vary 10 things at the same time and solve a 10 dimensional optimization problem, or maybe more. Uh, and so clearly that's the kind of thing a computer can do. You know, that's not necessarily artificial intelligence, that's just optimization. It's been done for, for decades, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the, what we would call, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms are um, useful in optimization problems. So, um, yeah, we are using elements of what you might call um, machine learning um, in part of the optimization algorithms that we are, are implementing into our automated uh, capabilities. Got it. Okay, fair enough. And and, um, and I was going to ask you a question. This is a hypothetical question about the, the like the future of frac. As you're aware, you go on a frac site. You know, you have a guy sitting in, you know, frac man, or maybe not now because of COVID nineteen and everything. He's probably uh, sitting in a company man shack. You know. And basically uh, calling the frac stages. Hey, let's let's do this. Let's let's grab rates. Let's increase that far. Let's do this and let's do that. You know. So you see a lot of um, subjective, like a lot of subjectivity that goes into that, right? You know. Yeah. So you have ten different consultants. They will call the frac differently, right? So yeah. do you think that we'll have not not now in the next like couple, let's say in the next five ten years, do you think we'll have an autonomous frac where design is adjusted on the fly? Uh, based on data that is gathered real time, you know, as opposed to like, you know, somebody sitting there and saying, do this and do that, you know, the, 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 the machine itself run, runs the frack and basically makes decision real time based on the data that, that is being gathered like real time. Mm, uh, yeah, I think maybe. So, I mean, going back to the, the drilling analogy, um, you know, I think it's clear that you could trust a computer to optimize like a small number of parameters to optimize rate of penetration. Yeah. But I wouldn't trust a computer to run the whole drilling site, you know, because things are in fact unpredictable, right? And, and so computers can solve very discrete and unique problems, but reality is more diverse and unpredictable um, than, than that. And so first off, a human being needs to be running the frack job, just like the human being should be running the drill job, <laughs> you know, the drilling. No question about that. Can we pick out some of the most tedious or perhaps specific aspects of running the frack job and hand that off to a computer? Yes, I think that is possible. Got it. Um, you know, uh, I could see that, but but no, I mean, I think a, an experienced human being needs to be running the show, and we should use computers to assist in in specific things like optimizing weight on better pen, rate of penetration. Um, mm -hmm. The other difference between I, I like this rate of penetration analogy and optimizing a frack design is you get instant feedback on rate of penetration. You change something, you immediately learn how rate of penetration changed. Yeah. And that's pretty much the whole ball game. Mm -hmm. um, and another analogy, I went, going back to screen out, you know, again, if the well did screen out, you, you know that, you know, <laughs> you find that out. Right. Um, but now if we're talking about optimizing a frack design in shale, you don't get instant feedback on whether or not you did the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very frustrating and difficult, but it's also um, you know, probably why my company exists because if this was easy, then you wouldn't need my company. Mm -hmm. um, you're trying to optimize net present value. You're not necessarily trying to optimize production. You're not necessarily, you know, because, because you, could, you could be spending too much money on that production, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the production is the outcome of a complex series of things, such as what's the fracture spacing and then the fractures interfere during production, multi-phase flow effects happen. You can have parent-child interaction. And so uh, you, you don't know at the end of the frac job, whether you did a good or bad frac job. I mean, you know, if you put it away, you know, if you did the design, but you don't actually know if that was um, the best economic decision for the company. Well, you can go out and pump fractures at hundred foot cluster spacing and it'd probably be easy to pump that job, you know. Um, there's no stress shadowing, you know, you put it away. Uh, 
But that doesn't mean that that's what made the company money in the long run, because what matters is the production over the next five to 10 years, how much money was spent and, and all that. And so that's another problem is when you have an attenuation between outcome and input, that's a big problem for machine learning because you need to train it on something. Um, and so, yeah, maybe we could start to use proxies, um, but that's, that's, that's a big problem. So, so, so how can you know in real time whether or not you're doing the thing that optimizes net present value? Big, fuzzy, challenging problem. And uh, that's the, the primary technical challenge uh, to what you just described. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. That's, 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 that's a fair question. And I mean, that's, that's a fair answer. Okay. So is there anything that excites you about the future of data science? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it's transforming uh, the global economy. Um, you know, these new deep learning algorithms are very powerful and, and um, you know, achieving amazing things. Um, okay. So I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's fascinating. And, and, you know, this, all the things I was saying about how I, you know, it's hard to solve complex problems. You know, I'm 34. Uh, I bet in my lifetime, we have artificial intelligence that can solve more open-ended complex problems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that's fascinating. Um, but I, I think in 2020, I just think we have to make sure that we choose the right problems for these algorithms. And the right problems are our focused algorithms where we have a lot of data, uh, quick response so that it's easy to evaluate good and bad and right and wrong. Um, and if we can we can put them on these discrete focused problems in the right context, then we can just crush it. Uh, but we need to be cautious about applying it to everything everywhere. Right, no, that, that, that's that's fair. Cause I mean, yeah, I, I, I think from like your point of view, you're saying that, hey, you know, you gotta look, look at problems that have, uh, that can create value based on the current algorithms that we have. Maybe in the future, some genius comes up with some really, uh, out of the box thinking algorithm that no, that nobody has ever thought of before and can solve many more problems. But right now, with the limitations that we have, we got to be careful what, what we use. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Common sense. Okay. And, and then, so a, a question that a lot of people ask is: Is will AI in general create more jobs than it eliminate? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people ask that question, you know, because people talk about, for example, truck drivers. They say, well, truck drivers, you know, uh, we're going to have the autonomous tr trucks that can, you know, drive themselves and so on and so forth. But I, I tell people, well, look, if you, if you look at the statistics right now, there are 50,000, you know, uh, truck driving jobs that they cannot be filled, you know. <laughs> so I, I feel like the AI can eliminate a lot of the repetitive jobs, you know, sure. that, that, that nobody really want to do in general, you know, but it's not going to, and that's just my personal opinion, you know, so I was going to kind of get your thoughts on will AI create more jobs than it eliminates? In, like, like, like in yeah, general. I mean, I think, uh, you know, welcome to capitalism, right? right. Uh, this is a question that people have been asking for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. So yes, new technology comes along, it eliminates some jobs, it creates new jobs, and overall, it creates overall wealth for society. And so, you know, you're in society, and if you're in a job that looks like it's going to be eliminated by AI, because probably some will, uh, you should probably start thinking ahead and, and figuring out what you're going to do when that job doesn't exist. Because is it possible that someday, um, you know, AI will drive trucks on the highway? Yeah, that's definitely possible. And if I'm a truck driver today, just make sure you got a backup plan because that might happen, you know. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, but we all live in the reality of, of you know, this is society and, and um that's how technology and capitalism work. <laughs> so it's a harsh answer, but you you know that we've just got to ride that wave, and that's that's the world we live in. Yeah, we just got to know your next five moves to see what you're gonna do next, basically. I guess yeah. fair enough. And then, um, so when you when you look at a regular is like a, a regular engineer job, a production engineer, completion engineer, reservoir engineer, what would it look like five years from now? Would it look completely different, or would it be? Uh, the same as like they are right now? Well, you know, I mean, I think our industry makes a lot of effort and innovation. Um, and in some ways we do innovate a lot, but, um, and also in other ways, we, you know, we don't innovate that much. In five years, no, I don't think the day-to-day -day job of, of reservoir production engineers is going to be dramatically different. <laughs> I expect that there's going to be a lot of people doing decline curve analysis and reservoir engineering in five years. <laughs> now, but can, can we make their job a little easier and a little better? Yeah, there's a jillion companies out there trying to make decline curve analysis a little more convenient 
and a little bit more streamlined and effective. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, you may be using a different piece of software in five years to do decline curve analysis, right? Uh, I, I really hope you're using a different crack simulator in five years. I think you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, I see incremental improvements. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't see some kind of transformative upheaval in, in the day-to-day -day lives of, of production and reservoir engineer, but there will certainly be changes. No question. You know, we will stop doing some things that we don't need to do anymore, just in the way, you know, we have computers, we have spreadsheets. <laughs> they didn't have Excel 40 years ago. And so that changed some workflows, but you know, we're fundamentally doing the same thing, just using slightly better tools. And I think that's probably what's going to keep happening. Got it. Got it. And then one final question. And uh, so the final question is, do you have any recommendations for, you know, anyone uh, for a fresh college graduate that is, that is like starting out any final oh, yeah, sure. recommendations? Yeah, sure. Number one is, is, you know, you just have got to be able to write some kind of scripting language to do something. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, um, you know, whether it's Python or MATLAB or something, you know, as an engineer, just a jillions of times you have a task that could be automated by a simple computer program that you write yeah. and it just saves an incredible amount of time. And you just got to know how to do that. And so the more basic proficiency you have in computer programming, that to me is like knowing how to do algebra if you're an engineer in 2020. Cool. Uh, just huge. That's the most important thing. Second is, um, you know, communication is just so important. Um, you've got to be able to give a really good 20 minute PowerPoint presentation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you just have got to be able to do that. Right. <laughs> That's really important. Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, and thirdly, you know, just, just keep that learning and, and growth mentality. You know, I, I'm a big believer in a growth mentality. Um, the idea that, um, you know, you should constantly be trying to improve and, and do better. And if you believe that you can improve and do better, then you very likely will improve and do better as long as you're willing to put in some effort and time on that. And, um, you know, I personally I always try to turn weakness into strength. And that's true of my company. You know, when we, three years ago, the things that I thought were weaknesses, now I think they're some of our strengths, you know, and you can improve, you know, it doesn't happen overnight but it can happen. And so I think if you kind of have that mentality, that in a humility in the sense that um, I think what holds people back from improving and doing better is, is actually a lack of humility. Uh, you have to be honest with yourself and be really ready to say, you know, Hey, I, I could have done that better. I made a mistake. This could be improved. And um, when you're willing to just say, yeah, I could, I need to listen to someone who disagrees with me or listen to the possibility that this could have been done better. If you're willing and able to, to internalize that, then you keep improving and you keep getting better. Uh, and if you don't, then you don't improve and then you just get older and you stay not better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, I think, the most important thing that, that I would tell anybody who, who's 22 or, or uh, 62. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's very good. I, I, at the end, I'd like to also, like you talked about humility and talked about all those things. I wanted to recommend a book by Ray Dalio. He's a billionaire hedge fund manager called Principal. A uh, great book for somebody, you know, very young, just starting out, has a lot of good, good information in there. So Principle by Ray Dalio, check it out. You know, I don't get anything out of this book. I'm just, I just read, read it myself. I love the book. It, it really, I had a lot of impact on myself, you know, so for those of you guys starting out, I definitely yeah, cool. uh, recommend that. But Mark, we'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. Mark, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. I know this is like early in the morning. Um, really appreciate your time. Is it what time is right your time right now? I'm, I actually live in North Carolina, so I'm what? at 1045. I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> I used to live in California, but I've actually moved uh, this year. My wife's doing a fellowship at Duke, so I'm, I'm in North Carolina for one year. I got you. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm in Dallas, Texas now, so it's about 945, 947. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Well, Mark, again, thank you so much. We appreciate it. That was a great podcast. I think I, I learned a lot like myself and ho hopefully we can bring you back on like, uh, you know, so many uh, podcasts like down the road. Well, it was, it was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Always good talking to us. Yeah. Thanks Mark. All right. Bye.